panel discussion called Decolonizing Design, a conversation on Indigenous architecture and housing. We're lucky to have with us four um, esteemed colleagues, ar architects and student, um, Masters of Interior Design student and research assistant uh, here today. We have Lancelot um, Kaur, He's an associate professor and acting head of the Department of Architecture and University of Manitoba. Dr. Shauna Mallory Hill, associate professor, Department of Interior Design, University of Manitoba. Sean Bailey, assistant professor and Métis architect, again with the Department of Architecture. And Katrina Salis, master of interior design student with the Department of Interior Design, University of Manitoba. I want to give a land acknowledgement that we're here on Treaty 1 territory, the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Inanu, Inu, Dakota, Inuit, and Dene people, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. This is where we're zooming from, but we get our water from uh, Shoal Lake, First Nation, uh, in Treaty 3, and we get our hydro from Treaty 5 territory. So we're truly connected and we have lots of relationships with different treaty territories. Um, and as such, as treaty people, we, we need to acknowledge the damage of the past, present, and commit to working in meaningful partnership with First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. So now I will stop sharing my screen and I'll let Lance Scott go ahead. Hi, Shirley. Uh, thanks very much. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm uh, really honored to be here today with um, uh, my, my colleagues and with you all. Thank you for joining us. Um, today we're going to be talking about decolonizing design, uh, housing design uh, with, and, with and for First Nations communities. And uh, we three, uh, I guess, groups are going to be presenting uh, some of our experiences working with First Nations communities. Um, with the subject of uh, design um, and uh, housing as the main uh, central figure. I do want to acknowledge that uh, I come from the Wissahickon Valley in uh, Pennsylvania in the United States, uh, and uh, it's the homeland of the Lenape uh, people, and um, I'm uh, honored to be here in Treaty 1 territory uh, where I currently live and, uh, and teach from. Um, I'm going to share my um, slide here. Okay, can everybody see that? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. So this pro uh, project that I'm gonna be presenting um, is a project called Secuway, and it is a collaboration between um, myself and Dr. Linda Larcom, uh, along with uh, several other uh, research colleagues uh, who we partnered with and, um, and also um, the communities of Tadouli Lake and Lac Broche uh, in Northern Manitoba. And this project uh, was designed uh, around the research that Dr. Larcom has carried out for over a decade in these communities, looking at the relationship between housing and uh, health. And my role in it um, was in reference to a design architecture design studio that I uh, teach every year with approximately 13 uh, uh, design students in the undergraduate and master's level uh, course at the University of Manitoba. And uh, what I wanna do today is talk a little bit about this project as a demonstration about how uh, we at the University of Manitoba are exploring uh, the questions about design sovereignty um, and working with meth new ways of working with uh, First Nations communities where um, academic um, 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 facilities are able to empower and uh, support uh, indigenous sovereignty towards design and housing uh, construction. So this project was based in Tadouli Lake and, North and, um, and uh, Lac Broche, uh, which are two of the northernmost uh, indigenous reserves, uh, First Nations reserves in uh, Manitoba. They're quite remote and fly-in only. And some of the basis of this uh, project, the, the foundations of this product were aimed at several particular goals. One of them was to determine how housing design can improve physical and mental health of the Dene people uh, living in these two communities. Uh, 
and we also were interested to determine how housing design can promote traditional knowledge and values in Diné communities. We wanted to learn from traditional approaches to settlement and construction methods and to incorporate this knowledge in towards new designs for the community. We wanted to explore how housing design can encourage cultural activities and identity and to create a meaningful partnership and friendship between our students and our project leaders from the community and ourselves within the university. And finally, fundamental to all of this was of course the idea and the experience of including community members in all phases of the research from the conception of it all the way through until the end. And this is incredibly important because it helps to establish expectations and helps to guide the uh, motivations from everyone involved to make sure that we are all doing pulling together in the, in the same direction. Um, the idea of looking at indigenous uh, traditional indigenous architecture is actually incredibly important um, to the thinking in this project because it acknowledges the role of what housing has always meant for indigenous people and thinking about the role that a house or a home would play in supporting life in the everyday. The home was not just a structure for indigenous families um, throughout time but rather a site for engagement, a site for supporting life, traditional activities, for engendering cultural activities and supporting dialogue, helping to um, make uh, food and uh, preservation, self-preservation possible, um, food sovereignty, allowing for the idea of being able to follow um, uh, hunting paths and looking at specifically trap lines throughout various seasons uh, throughout the year um, it's a site for actually transferring knowledge, for teaching, for learning and discovery. It is the site that in itself, the architecture itself acts as a bridge between the experience of being human and the spiritual and land-based um, knowledge that exists and feeds all of indigenous activities in these, especially in these remote areas. So the house itself is more than a structure. It is in fact an expression of life itself. We still believe this today. And this is something that we believe is missing from the conversations about housing design for indigenous people and with indigenous people. So when we as, uh, work with our students and we traveled to Tuduli Lake and Lac Broche, we looked specifically at the long histories that these Dene people had in the northern areas of Manitoba and actually in some of the southern reaches of Nunavut uh, and the histories that have impacted and shaped the way that they relate to those lands. And that has changed over time and that reality still lives today. So when we started this project, we worked very closely with these two communities and in each community in Turuli Lake and Lac Broche, we had elder representatives that were project partners that we identified from the very beginning and we also worked to identify youths uh, in these two communities to be project partners as well, to work with us and to collaborate with us and our students um, as a form of dialogue to, to create relationships with each other. We looked very carefully at the traditions in these communities and the, the um, ways in which hunting and gathering and, and actually um, the preparations of foods and the traditions that would uh, ensue to create uh, food sovereignty uh, traditionally was very important. Uh, we looked at the games and the cultural activities that are still active today and forms of dialogue and communications with other communities, especially other Dene communities uh, that will come and travel to uh, Tuduli Lake and Lac Broche as, as forms of ritual and forms of gathering. We brought our youth, our students uh, from University of Manitoba to Tuduli Lake and Lac Broche. Uh, and this is in fact Tuduli Lake here. And you can see that in the Northern Reserves, it's surrounded by absolutely majestic and um, quite powerful landscapes. Um, and these landscapes form the basis of a lot of the activities that take place within these reserves. We explored the, um, the communities and we talked with elders, we talked with youth, and we were lucky enough to partake and to participate in the activities. But during this time, we were also bearing witness to the inequities and the insufficiencies of the current ways and state of housing and how it's being supplied. And of course, these challenges are very well known, so I won't spend a lot of time on them, but I must acknowledge that overcrowding, uh, not spelled properly there, I apologize for the typo, 
um, is, a, is a very big determinant of challenges and also impacts human health. Um, foundations and structural problems due to moving uh, lands and grounds and improper construction techniques. Uh, we, of course, have issues of vandalism and the inability to repair things, which happens to all buildings uh, because of a lack of resources. We have impacts of moisture from above, from failing roof systems and failing um, foundation systems that create challenges from moisture from below. And we also have groundwater and soil contamination because water is in fact brought in and, um, and also so is oil that leaks into these areas and creates toxic ground contaminated issues, which of course impacts human health as well. But despite all of these incredible challenges, the resiliency of these communities has been awe-inspiring. The stories that we would hear from our elder partners would tell us all about why and how they began to modify their homes and to build new structures outside of them to be able to create, for example, this granny suite and uh, elder cabin that on the outside to be able to have a proper site to help to impart uh, the youth with uh, stories and knowledge. The, um, the uh, teepee here that we see in the middle is a uh, smokehouse for Lizette, who's one of the elders we worked with, and she would in fact smoke caribou meat uh, in there for her family. We brought our students out onto the land. This is Lizette up in the top left here, actually in the red. Um, and uh, we were taking part in some of the basic survival skills that they would teach the youth in these communities. And it's incredibly important to take time out on the land to, in fact, take part in the butchering that uh, Lizette was teaching our students on how to do properly, and then taking it out to the smokehouse teepee to, to in fact, uh, dry out and then finally uh, feast on later together. Going out onto the ice for after only five days of having the first freeze in the area uh, to, to, in fact, take part in the fishing ritual that would also be an incredibly important part of the cultural activities and working with the, um, the knowledge keepers in this area to be able to discover the techniques that have been passed down for generation to generation to make fishing possible using these uh, very basic but ingenious approaches and methods. We would also take part in uh, hand games, which is a traditional uh, game that was played in this uh, part of Manitoba, uh, which is a, a game of strategy, of wit and humor, which are all currencies of dialogue and negotiation between people within a community and of course, communities that come to visit. We would feast together and feasting of course is central to dialogue, it's central to building trust and it's central to understanding. So we worked with the communities, of course, to help prepare uh, the meals that were being offered here. Uh, we can see here the moose meat patties that were being offered and a lot of the stews. Absolutely amazing and incredible um, uh, opportunity for a lot of the uh, students in our program who had never traveled north before. Community consultation was also central to this, to be able to understand and listen to the stories and to uh, hear the realities and uh, the challenges and of course the, the beautiful opportunities that exist in these communities and what housing means to them and what was missing from housing to support the life that is actually desired in these communities. So the student exchange, as I mentioned, was central to this dialogue and this consultation. The youth from our program can, um, spoke and became friends with the youth from their programs and the elders themselves. There was design charrettes, which is a kind of intensive working period of brainstorming about houses and what they could look like and what they could support in terms of a lifestyle was very important. We also brought the youth from these communities to the University uh, Faculty of Medicine as well to uh, discover how uh, medicine is being taught and what role the, uh, that um, students have the, and the professors have in uh, communicating activities in the university programs. And for many youth in Toulouse and Lac Brochet, this was their first time to a university setting. So that idea of breaking down the barriers and actually sharing each other's worlds was absolutely central to this experience. And based on this, we engaged in dialogue about housing design itself. And a lot of the knowledge that came out of these conversations was very clear that the community members have a very deep sense of understanding of what they need and what they would love to see and, um, and the possibilities and the imagination that they have for designing better homes. And this informed the process for our students to be able to design with. And some of the main points that we, have dis we discovered in this project that were reflected in the student projects is the importance of material identity, material sourcing, having sovereignty and the ability to decide for themselves, 
uh, and have control of where materials come from. The idea of incorporating traditional activities within the home themselves, and of course on the land adjacent to the homes and outside of the homes. Energy independence, so finding ways to be independent from the reliance on southern forms of, um, of energy sources, so that if and when there are disruptions that the community is not, in fact, um, a disadvantage from this and in fact, uh, returning to earlier sources of heat also support other traditions like food drying and clothes drying and heating. Food security is another critical part of this and the impact of course shipping food far up north um, and non-traditional foods is also a very big challenge for these communities. And finally, uh, the lifestyle, all the different activity, activities uh, culminating together and needing to be incorporated in a house design. So now the conversation of design um, as being in fact a sovereign and, and, and critical um, um, part of the uh, voice of the community when, when the conversation of houses is, is expressed is no longer just about the number of bedrooms needed or the number of houses needed as objects, but in fact, an expression about a life that is worth living, a life that is desired to be lived. I will move very quickly through just a couple of quick examples to show you what I mean. Evan Taylor created a timber house which was the idea of training youth in these communities as a collaboration with UCN, University College of the North, to incorporate um, a, a framework for teaching uh, youth in these communities to work with the lumber that is around the communities. And in fact, turning the trees quite directly of, of tall timber and of course milled lumber into homes. And he worked on developing the building system to support this that, that uh, would allow for um, uh, especially um, single, uh, single youth uh, from these communities to be able to build, them, uh, build their own homes. Um, uh, Branton Lescue looked at rammed earth houses. He looked specifically at the soil a makeup of this area, which had a lot of sand and silty loam in it. Um, and he looked at the traditions of being able to do, use rammed earth. Um, and it turned out that the soil in this area was actually quite um, excellent for the use of rammed earth. So we explored the possibilities of using rammed earth to create wall systems so that in fact materials are being sourced as much as possible from the area and not uh, being shipped from the south. And finally, Carson Weeb looked at creating an elder's cabin. And what he did was looked at the way and in, um, in documenting the various activities that take place on the land and looking at creating a, a structure where elders could retreat to with youth to train, uh, to, to impart knowledge and to share in cultural activities and to in fact create structures that use whole timbers to uh, create wood trusses and not have to ship them up north and looked at cutting logs to length to make a stack, a log stack wall structure. This is the interior of his elders cabin that he designed. And you can see some of these uh, holes are created for little windows, in fact, but uh, for thermal uses, and that the walls themselves can become sites for stretching hides and uh, supporting canoes and, and creating other cultural activities to support the elder, elders' work in that community. All of this work uh, culminated into a publication that uh, Linda and I uh, worked with uh, the youth, uh, the students in this project to produce, um, and uh, it's called Sekaway My House. Um, and this is um, available in PDF form and we have hard copies of that as well. If you're interested, you can of course reach out and be happy to share that with you. Um, next steps, what we learned from this and what we are bringing forward in this Minima Dizawin uh, project that uh, Shirley uh, is, um, is uh, leading uh, with a lot of us here is that the realism of a long-term uh, with a long-term outlook. So taking a look at the realities um, in these communities and working with the communities to incorporate that in a long-term endeavor, not a short-term a short -term answer. Community-led design projects. We're centrally interested in the design trajectories led by community dialogue and, um, and not um, from um, interests from the outside guiding that. Community-based need assessments. So in other words, communities in fact telling us what is actually needed, not assumed from the outside. Tangible outcomes, that is absolutely critical moving forward, that all work taking place in partnership with these uh, communities is actually resulting in something tangible to better the lives of the community members, not just symbolically. Education uh, and capacity building for these Northern communities. Uh, so we're interested in capacity building as a central theme to that. Energy, uh, education and capacity building for us. 
Uh, this is, and when I say us, I'm talking about this and from the South and I'm working with Northern communities. And of course, as non-Indigenous people to recognize that these projects are meant to in, in fact increase our ability to better understand um, how our community partners, uh, what they're living with and what they would like to um, achieve and for us to have greater empathy towards that. Continual involvement with youth from the, between the North and the South, that this is also important to create relationships and friendships. And finally, working together to find a common solution. These are uh, our partners, project leaders, and of course, the students from both communities. And um, Masi Cho, thank you for your time. Thank you, Lancelot. So we'll now move uh, to Shauna uh, Maori Hill and um, We'll save questions to the end if that's okay with everyone. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Um, Kat and I are going to talk about our experience working in community academic uh, partnership project that is helping to build uh, capacity towards housing independence in, in uh, remote First Nations. I, I want to note that we are uh, just two people involved in a large interdisciplinary team that is uh, working on this project that's led by Dr. Shirley Thompson of the uh, National Resources Institute. And this is about year three of a multi-year project. So this is kind of a midway report on, on what we've been doing and what we've been learning. The project and the communities we are working with are located in Island Lake. Um, it is home to three First Nation communities. Uh, we are working with Wasagamak and Garden Hill. Uh, the Island Lake is uh, located in the heart of a vast boreal forest that extends, um, as you know, coast to coast. Island Lake is the sixth largest lake in the province of Manitoba. It's part of the Hayes River uh, drainage basin. Island Lake drains into to, uh, God's Lake and then ultimately uh, into the Hay River and, um, and Hudson's Bay. And First Nations peoples have been living and navigating these waterways for thousands of years. But from the south, uh, these communities are remote. The only way in to reach them is by air and then by boat. Uh, so for a brief period in the winter, there are ice roads, um, but still it's a long drive from Winnipeg, 500 kilometers. Across Canada, First Nation communities are experiencing housing crisis. Uh, we have housing that needs major repair. There's not enough housing. There's a need for uh, affordable housing. Um, in addition to the housing crisis, there is an unemployment crisis. In Garden Hill, where we're working, uh, the employment rate amongst the youth is close to 84%, which is huge. So uh, visiting these remote First Nation communities for the first time, I saw so, so many systemic challenges. There are too many to talk about in this short time I have, but uh, there were definitely uh, issues around restrictions of around material use, and despite living amidst this vast forest, most of the houses in the community were constructed using tools and materials that had to be brought up from the south. There were restrictions around the ways of building that use building designs and technologies from the south that just didn't make sense for the way people actually live in these communities. Uh, for example, uh, the design. You need a place for boots and coats. You need a place to prepare and store land-based foods, but the housing grants that are available to these communities do not in fund the construction of proper porches or utility rooms. They had technology like uh, heat recovery ventilators that were soon broken. There were no parts to fix them. There was no capacity or understanding in the community on how to repair them. And there's a lack of infrastructure. Um, as uh, mentioned, the North has uh, some silty say, uh, clay soil and rock conditions that hold the water at the surface. It's making drainage under and around homes a huge issue. There's no municipal stormwater management systems. Uh, folks are living in the midst of a freshwater lake, but many homes lack connection to municipal water systems that have safe water, that have sewer treatment. They're located in the middle of a forest, but many homes rely almost exclusively on, on hydro, which, is, which can be unreliable. And that's obviously significant when you're relying on hydro for heating. And of course, not enough houses leads to overcrowding and that leads to more problems, both social and as we've seen with COVID uh, health problems. So minobidazoism, <laughs> I cannot say it properly. 
sorry, Shirley, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, is a community-led project-based uh, education program. Uh, it seeks to build houses and uh, food sovereignty. The project objectives are to around three kind of major goals about sustainability, connecting to land and land-based practices, um, uh, to energy and resources locally, food independence. Um, it's about design that's affordable, buildable, dur durable, and culturally appropriate. It's about uh, community needs around economic development, around skills training, about education, about training people uh, that can remain in the community. So how do we get there? The project is focused on project-based education. In, the, in other words, learning by doing, and it's based on learning by doing in the community. So we're moving from standing tree to standing home. Local participants are given training um, and skills in sustainable forest management, milling lumber, designing homes, constructing homes. And the end goal is to have employable skills that they can use or pass on to others, as in that train a trainer. Uh, part of my role was to look at what was working and what was not in existing housing in these communities. Uh, this wood frame construction on the upper left, Garden Hill, um, illustrates some very big challenges with maintenance and uh, with no water supply and unreliable electrical supply. Uh, the second um, is a, in Wasagamuk, a standard CMAC type home designed on Southern design codes and standards. Disabled HRV, therefore, um, it has no adequate ventilation system. It has an enclosed crawl space that can lead to moisture problems on these very poorly drained sites. And on the bottom is one of an example of what works. We had the uh, opportunity to visit an owner built log home that was dry and uh, beautifully appointed inside. You can see some image right there on the, on the bottom right. Another of my roles was to help facilitate participatory design sessions in the community that we called uh, community cafes. The community cafes were open to the entire community along with our participants and gave people an opportunity to talk about housing design in their community, what works and what doesn't. During the, during the cafes, we used drawing to facilitate the conversations about, about their existing home designs and to talk about how we can improve and make them better. Um, this is uh, an important part of uh, uh, to talk about. Or this image is here because I want to talk about the important roles of elders at the community cafe. Uh, we invited elders to open uh, the meetings with prayer and drumming, but we also invited elders to participate in the meetings. And this woman is talking about her experience of pulling back her grandchild's bed only to find uh, the, there was mold covering the floor and the walls. Like a lot of the other older adults here, she had a lot of experience to share and she wasn't keen on, on writing or drawing that down. Uh, she just wanted to tell her story. And she was speaking on decree. Uh, even though we had a translator, we also had a videographer on site who recorded everything she said without interruption so we could listen to it again later. I think the point here is that listening is a really important part of participatory planning. Um, as uh, Lancelot mentioned, feasting is a big part of uh, everything we do when we're working with community. In addition to listening, sharing meals was super important. Um, all of our cafe participants were given meals that were locally catered, locally sourced, land-based food, um, and we provided in that way revenue to community members. So I'm going to get Kat to talk about what the outcome of those uh, uh, design cafes were all uh, resulted in everyone. So yes, after the community cafes and various conversations with community members, we ended up with a simple but effective design. So together we came up with a home that addressed the needs that support the lifestyles that come along with living in remote northern communities. So this includes um, design features such as an enclosed porch. So not only does it provide a space to prepare and store game as well as equipment, but it also acts as a weather and dirt barrier before entering the home. So entering from the enclosed porch is the utility room where boots and coats can be stored. The laundry and washroom is also located in this utility area so that any additional dirt and mud can be rid of in this space if need be. So the center of the home is open concept which allows for comfortable gatherings as well as wakes. 
And the windows and the doors in this open area allow for some cross ventilation to go through the home. The second, um, the second entrance uh, leads out to a porch of its own, uh, which is good for anyone who uh, smokes or wants to sit outside. And lastly, there is a centralized wood burning stove, which is extremely important to include as it ensures that there is an effective heat source that keeps the house warm and dry as energy dependence in Island Lake is extremely unreliable. Next slide. So it also should be noted that the simple design is intentional as it calls for simple construction, which is perfect to use when teaching students who have not built before how uh, to uh, go forward with home building in their communities. Next slide. Um, so after coming up with the design, we grappled over different foundation types. So screw piles seen on the drawing on the left would be ideal in future applications as it keeps the home lifted and dry. However, for reasons to do with getting materials and certain machines to Island Lake, we ended up having to move forward with an enclosed crawl space instead. However, it is four feet off the ground and we are hoping that this new design uh, will also contribute to that lifted and dry effect. Next slide. <laughs> so after our, um, so after we decided on a foundation, we had a final consultation with the Nimo Bimadazuin uh, partnership uh, members, as well as band members from Wasagamack and Garden Hill to make sure that um, certain needs were being met. And next slide, after our drawing set was finalized and stamped, we started the building process, which admittedly did not go exactly as planned. So uh, next slide, oh yeah, perfect. So right off the bat, acquiring materials and tools is an ongoing challenge in remote First Nations communities. On top of that, the allocated space for the sawmill and material storage actually burned down with our materials inside, which was an obvious setback to say the least. So in order to replace some of these materials, winter roads were required, which obviously impacted our timeline as it was around the beginning of the summer when our materials had had burned. However, challenges like these um, are not unusual in, in remote communities like Wasagamack and Garden Hill, thus making these groups of students and home builders extremely creative and resourceful. So without skipping a beat, the students jumped into emptying out a large trailer to store new materials as it slowly began to arrive, as well as cleared off a piece of land so that the sawmill could be used outdoors. From there, students began their lessons on how to operate the sawmill in order to grade local lumber. Additionally, there was a church under construction in Wasagamack that had been abandoned. The students wasted no time in jumping on that site to help complete the church in between working on the home. And although this was not the start that we kind of intended, uh, the students were learning through the experiences that they were having, and that was really the most important part of the whole program to begin with. Um, eventually, the lumber was graded and materials started to show up, allowing for construction on the homes to progress. So on this slide, I have a couple images of in-class lessons as well as their on-site applications um, as those teachings kind of progressed throughout the home building process. As for construction updates, COVID, much like everything else, made everything that was already complicated a little bit more difficult. Uh, materials were hard to come by and instructors that traveled to and from communities no longer can make regular visits. Wasagamak's home uh, that you're looking at right now is framed, boarded, and has shingles, but remains unfinished for now. However, it has in, uh, plans to be finished in future. As for Garden Hill, uh, they have begun to finish the exterior of the home and have installed all doors and windows. So the accomplishments of the students go far beyond the construction and eventual completion of these homes. For example, Garden Hills Band hired six people directly from the program. Three students got jobs in construction elsewhere. Uh, two students from Garden Hill are doing their own independent business using the skills that they learned from the program. And one student from Wasagamack has used his working in height certification to get a job in roofing. 
So we are still in the process of gathering all the data from Rosagamac and Garden Hill. So some of the students and their endeavors are actually missing from this chart. So really think of it as a bar that's filling. So however, the employment and skills that will be, um, that were learned will be the long lasting uh, changes seen in these communities. So in summary, this project was not simply about designing and building homes. It was about the learning process, certification, team building and education acquired along the way. Community led design proved to be an undeniable necessity when creating culturally appropriate homes. Education certification reinstated power back into the community so that moving forward, develop, developing young professionals can work together to tackle their own housing crisis as they see best fit. Lastly, this collaboration between various people from different backgrounds, professions, and life experiences contribute to reconciliation from person to person. And hopefully as the time progresses and housing issues in, like, in Island Lakes begin to resolve from within the community will lead to reconciliation on a larger scale. And in saying that, thank you all for listening and we will move on to Sean Bailey. Thank you so much. And wonderful to see everything together, including the employment stats there. Can everybody see my screen? Perfect. Well, I just want to say thank you, Shirley, for having me. It's really amazing to be a part of this and to be presenting along with my colleagues, too. Um, this is more of a story about a relationship building exercise um, with the community of Shoal Lake 40. And I'll just start sort of at the beginning. Um, I was born and raised in a remote area in Lake of the Woods. Um, there was no road access. And so me and my sister used to take a boat to school every day. Um, in between seasons, my dad used to make a, a wind jammer, like a rice picking boat. And we had hockey sticks as brakes. And it was just really amazing experience that really um, grounded my roots to the land. And that's one thing I always wanted to pass on to my daughter was that experience. And so we're always going out to the land and, and engaging with it. And this is my inspiration. This is my partner, Shannon. Um, she's a uh, administrator of the school board and she has the indigenous portfolio and really her way of thinking about um, relationship building is sort of what inspired me in my work. And so she does. Um, and this is my dog, Marley. Marley also travels around the schools. Yeah, Marley's a therapy dog, um, providing comfort and eating a lot of extra sandwiches. These are some of the initiatives that Shannon has instilled at the school. And so um, traditional harvesting wild rice, um, processing wild rice, and also this sort of play-based forest education. So, you know, not really determined on swing sets, but going out into nature and playing and seeing what you can discover. Hiding, and one, one amazing thing that I've noticed with all of this is sort of the being in nature is that one way um, where non-Indigenous Indigenous can come together. And uh, the non-Indigenous students in the school are so excited to learn all these traditional skills. It's quite amazing. So taking that and taking that inspiration from my partner, um, I uh, was accepted a position at the University of Manitoba um, as the Indigenous scholar there, which has been this really rewarding um, experience for me and along this path with working with amazing people. And our first project was we had our design studio do this indigenous housing competition with architects without borders. And at this presentation, a jury member, um, her name was Roxanne Green from Shoal Lake 40 was presenting. And after that, we, I, um, she had this really amazing talk. And so I went up to her after and we had this conversation and our, our studio chose to um, address housing in her community. And so Shoal Lake 40, about, you know, 150 kilometers east of Kenora, it's where Winnipeg um, gets their water, as Shirley mentioned. And they have uh, forest isolation because of the aqueduct and the canal that runs through it. And they were forced onto the, the poor land in the community, the sort of the undesirable. And so 
Um, they've been fighting for a long time and they finally have Freedom Road. But before, but before Freedom Road, um, this is how they transferred, transported back and forth um, the Amic. And so this was a barge that uh, they would drive on and um, it broke down often. And if you were stranded, you were stranded. And so you would hope that you um, knew someone in the neighboring community to stay at Shoal Lake 39. So this is the Cal Canal that divided them. And as part of this process, Roxanne and I um, were really focused on, okay, like how do we bring the students and how can we do this in, in, a, in a way that fashion together? And so being the first time doing a design studio, we brought the students into the community and talked to the community and they told the stories and stories like, you know, because transportation of garbage is so, um, is so difficult here that, you know, our garbage dump has in the last 30 years has just, you know, filled up so much because of all the plastic, um, talking about the different ceremonies that are, that they were forced not to have. And so we made several visits to the community on the barge and the students are just so fascinated with it. They're so, um, they just loved listening to the story and the community really loved sharing their story. So that's the picture of the barge. And so some of the projects that we, we dove into is addressing housing. And so the communities, we meet with all the community members and we had workshops and these are some designs that kind of came out of those workshops. And so this project was called Hubbard and it really addressed the idea that the community would like to focus on in certain areas of, the, of their land and kind of hang together. And so this was addressing housing. How can you make communal housing by creating these spaces um, that are, are sort of like these public spaces. So, you know, you have two families living here, but there's still these areas to join together. And these are some rock drawings and renderings of the sections and creating these, these areas of play and excitement while connecting to the land. And so all of this design is coming from the stories heard by the community where this housing project was related to, um, you know, the idea of capacity building, like um, Lancelot said, how do you begin to build using, um, you know, wood from the land? Um, and then as we kept going, um, we knew that Freedom Road was coming, it was in construction. And so in the second term, we sort of looked at, okay, let's provide this as an opportunity for the community to get excited and to you know, create a vision for what their community can become with Shoal Lake 40 and Freedom Road. And so this talked about a, a sort of a multi-unit um, place or a multi-program uh, space, has a butcher, a market, a greenhouse, a bistro. And it's all about the idea of processing um, wild rice, processing meat, and sort of using this as a tourist opportunity to bring in people to the community to begin to um, share their story, but also share culture and also revive culture in the community. So these are some renderings of this project. You see the greenhouse over here, um, the butcher, you know, with the garage door to bring in the meat, um, this public market corridor, the market, and sort of the interior shot of the greenhouse. And here are some other renderings of sort of how this building begins to be situated on the land. This student um, heard a story about, you know, their powwow and how they had to hide it and they had no place in the community to have, have a powwow. So the student was talking about, okay, let's, I'm gonna propose a powwow with many of the programs that um, are included in the previous project, but I'm gonna put it by the water so that people can hear the drum and hear that story. And so it was a really moving project and the, and the community members at the review and the community members would come to every one of our um, interim reviews and talk about the designs. Um, they got quite emotional. And so this project also talked about capacity building, letting the community build their own structures and training. It had projects looking, you know, at food security um, sharing traditional culture. And so those, these two projects I last showed has a lot of similarities. But the impactful part of this work is going into the communities and sharing the culture. 
And so after that powwow grounds, I got an email asking if we would help um, develop a powwow grounds for the community. And of course we said yes. And so the next year the studio did that. And so here the studios are going on site and the elders had this really magical vision of this powwow grounds and they knew where it was gonna locate it. And it was on this really nice peninsula right here. Has a beach, they envision a campgrounds, a place for community to gather. And so our first task was that we had to do a tobacco tie. So we did a tobacco tie. Um, we also did a pipe ceremony. And so it's really amazing um, for the students to take part in that, especially when we did the smaller tobacco tie. The elder had us do this tie and we would, I would hold tobacco and then the student would, I would put it in the student holding the tie and it was, we just created this chain. And what the elder said at the end is that he wanted to watch us and to see how we work together, which is this really amazing thing. But as part of my mission too, it's always to connect people with the land. I think that that's one thing that we all have in common and especially with climate change, I think we need to build a relationship with that. So allowing the students to come into this land and experience the conditions like this really amazing um, ice just froze over. So when you walk on it, you can see the bottom. Um, a lot of the students have never really been on the land before. And it allows the opportunity for the communities to share their culture. Um, you know, harvesting fish through the ice, filleting fish, take part in sweat ceremonies, which is this really amazing um, experience. And so some of the designs for the powwow started with the process of um, model making, drawing, collaboration with the community. Um, these are just some preliminary drawings of what this powwow arbor could look like, um, a physical model of the powwow arbor. Um, this student here, you know, um, sort of developing, sitting on the peninsula, preparing renderings, and sort of this aerial view of what it would look like. So I'm happy to say that um, they submitted these drawings into a funding application and they are now have just been approved and they have retained an architecture firm to develop these ideas. So they will now have a powwow grounds. And the relationships that we build with the community were really excellent. So this was Jacinta and Lauren, which led to the our next project, which was a design and build project. And this one was a really powerful project for me. Um, it taught me a lot. Um, the elders, as part of the Palo Grounds, always dreamed of a feasting shelter, and the feasting shelter was located um, just adjacent to it, and it was a place for community and youth um, to come and hang together. So it was a design, build, project, and collaboration with Show Lake 40, Faculty of Architecture, and the Faculty of Engineering. And we're going to come together and design and build a feasting shelter. Foundation will be prepared by the community and we will prefab all the components at the University of Manitoba and ship them to the community in a shipping crate. So this enabled, you know, this local member to be employed to help, um, you know, prepare the land for the site. Throughout the whole process, we were invited to ceremony, to powwows, and they were so welcoming to the students. It was raining out, so we had to move um, the ceremony into the arena. Also asking the students to um, take part in lighting the fire outside and why you warm the drum. Um, they were really open and allowed us into their community, which was really amazing. But as we're presenting, it's moments like this where you begin to see the power of process in architecture. And you see the youth engaged in being excited and really taking an interest in what you're doing and hopefully inspiring a generation to move in that way. This was us at the university um, designing the shelter. Um, this is Elder Norman Mead from the University of Manitoba. He would make frequent visits and keep us in check. And so this is us pre prefabbing the components and this is the site being prepared by the community. Community received drawings from us and we would collaborate. Um, they're probably cursing our architectural drawings. And here's the everything packed up, ready to be shipped over. 
And here's the uh, slab preparation. So it was this really amazing thing where engaged community provided employment, um, communication. And so this was part of a funding grant. And then it's pictures like this that really mean a lot. So when we arrived on site, um, we, we stayed in the community for one week to build this. Um, the community members stayed on one side and the students were on the other side of the building site. But the power of I saw was that architectural processes have the ability to build relationships because as soon as we started making things, that's when relationships were formed. And that's where the power of the project came. Sharing ideas, sharing their skills, um, telling stories, swimming at night, the community members would stay with us after and uh, we would fish. This gentleman took us fishing. Um, he was so proud and so happy to take us fishing. That picture is 10 o'clock in the morning and he's bringing us his famous Cajun walleye for all of us to try. Fires at night alongside the structure gathering in a circle and it's it's pictures like this that really make it meaningful for me and that's you know emotional a relationship was built reconciliation happened there was an understanding in because of design and because of architecture and because of being creative together we were able to form really meaningful and long-lasting relationships and this is the structure as it stands now and uh, i'll be happy to say we will be doing um, a community garden for this community um, with youth. Um, they have a new school being built and uh, this garden will speak of food sovereignty and will be built adjacent to the school. So it'll be a teaching platform for the youth. And that's it, thank you. Thank you, a round of applause for all the great presentations, well done. Really beautiful to see all your um, all the work that's being done, all the creativity, all the you know really active reconciliation. So now it's question period. Um, is there anyone who has their hands ra raised? To um, why don't we start with Demos or Pe Penos? Do you want to ask a question? How about I ask a question in the meantime? Is so, Sean, incredible the work you're doing, and that you were able then to take the next step of actually getting um, the design funded. And how does that work? Like, how, how are you um, able to move from an education environment, uh, you know, towards, <laughs> and this is what what I try to do too, is towards actually working with the community to meet their needs and goals and desires. You know, Shirley, I don't know if this will answer your question, but it's like, I want to do this, I want to help. And I just, for some reason you follow that and things just happen. Um, I don't know what, I don't know how to answer that other than, you know, rather than being just passionate, being driven and just making it work and things just fall in play. You, you know, I think, you know, you're in tune with how things are working, things just sort of fall into place. And so I guess it's a bit of a wing it sort of attitude. So, and you know, this is kind of my dream model is that the university and local colleges work and, and provide the skills in, you know, First Nations universities and colleges you work to provide the skills and develop their, you know, what they need, right? In the designs. Mm -hmm. Penos is asking a question oh, about the amazing imagery in every presentation. I guess it's more of a, a remark. And um, Christine Edward is saying, the program has expanded in the faculty, its work in communities, since our first cross-cultural studio with Fox Lake Cree Nation under Dean Whitty. And Christine, how long ago was that? Or do you know, Shauna? Uh, Dean Whitty was around in 2002, so it's been a while. <laughs> okay, great. 
Um, and Uriel has a question, how easy or difficult was it to translate input from the community, for, inst for instance, from the elders into design um, during the community process? Um, I think uh, I think the, the the it wasn't hard in a way that that we we clearly uh, well what I found was that it I I've probably learned more from this project than than I've <laughs> delivered to it in many ways because uh, but many of the many of the the issues are are very straightforward you know indoor environmental quality issues mold problems broken things. Uh, we know how to build houses. We know how to uh, to ventilate them properly. But um, I think what has been a massive misfit is just in a lack of consideration and in, in in fitting what the community is able to do with uh, with what we are providing from the south. And uh, certainly, um, this misfit has been the issue. Um, you know, when you can you can immediately see why these things are happening. And I think. What I brought up or tried to, to imbue in the beginning of my presentation was that there's some frustrating systemic problems <laughs> that are that you were constantly babbling about uh, that that have nothing to do with designing houses. They have to do with uh, um, administrative and uh, uh, code restrictions and other kinds of barriers that get in the way. In addition to the distance that's between us and uh, and these communities, so. Um, I think that uh, I didn't realize until we got there what the challenges the the young the young people were fully bilingual so so speaking in English that was not a problem uh, with talking with the students but uh, you know the elders had a lot of experience one in particular I recall had a lot of experience with how his grandparents' home was and how it was designed and I won't go into all the details but the fact that that the way it was laid out and the and the way he talked about it it made perfect sense for the way they uh lived in the community and, and with the, the kind of uh, uh land-based uh, they were doing trapping and hunting and fishing and, and just the way things worked with the family was perfect for this kind of how, how home design um you know but but for those that were were speaking in their first language, um, you know, it was hard to to have active trans. We had a translator there, but it was very hard because we didn't want to interrupt people where they were talking. Can you imagine saying, you know, some of these are not you know UN folks. They they didn't want to be interrupted every every sentence with the translation. So um, I think it wasn't my my idea, but uh, for sure Shirley was brilliant in bringing a videographer with us to film those conversations. So in addition to the, the drawing sets we, we came away with from, you know, these, either we were drawing them up or the participants were drawing them up, but we also had this kind of vast resource of imagery um, and conversations recorded. Um, so I thought that was brilliant. Um, I wasn't in charge of translating those. Those were, that was Shirley's job. <laughs> you can talk and, to and that. The, kudos to Karu Suzuki, who was the videographer. He is, was a wonderful talent to bring and person. And I think Linda had a question and then there's a question in the, the chat. Sure, thank you very much for the presentations. They were all uh, so interesting. Kat, I really appreciated how you took the time to evaluate the outcomes of, of the project with um, following up with um, the participants and, and seeing how that um, resulted in their own development going forward from the projects. And, and, it, and it struck me, there's so many, um, well, maybe there's not so many, but there are projects and, and um, programs that were not aware of just because of the lack of communication really between all of the groups working on First Nations housing just in Manitoba, never mind the rest of the country. And it would be, I'm just wondering what the appetite would be for um, bringing it all together. I mean, surely you're you're definitely uh, leading the way in doing that, but um, but um, making a more concerted effort to to get it out there to the communities so that they can participate. Also, knowing that there's limited capacity for all of the people involved to work in every community. So I'm just thinking about scaling these up across more communities, how we do that, and how we um, get this information out in, in multiple ways. Um, I mean, I recognize you're doing that, Shirley. But, uh, well, I actually have to give full tribute to Alex Wilson, 
from One House Many Nations. And all of the work here, like Sean, Sean and Mallory Hill, Lance Scott, yourself, Linda, Kat, um, and so many of my students. But uh, Alex Wilson from One House Many Nations um, has been the leader on this. And she's working with so many communities. And you know, she, she's absolutely an inspiration of how how to do things working with community and work with people. She actually has a question she's watching uh, from live stream. And she has a question uh, uh, for people. If a First Nations high school student is interested in being a designer or architect, what advice do you have for them? So that's kind of for you guys out there. And I want you to, if you can more fully answer Linda's question. Uh, maybe I'll take a stab at that. Um, so really quickly with respect to Linda's point, I think that is an incredibly important issue, uh, which is the, um, you know, these communities, they are, um, they are host to uh, so many different um, people coming to carry out research and partnerships uh, with a range of intentions, with a range of ambitions and so forth and so on. Um, but, um, but they're the ones bearing witness to all of that activity um, but it actually falls on us as researchers and academics and so forth to actually do the work of understanding what our colleagues are, are participating in so that we're not asking the same questions from the same people multiple times. There is such a thing as a research burnout, right? And participation burnout. It starts to eat away at our credibility and the, and the cultural and the, and the sort of capital that we build up over time of good faith. We have to have an impact, but that does mean paying attention, right? Um, so I'll just say that. So I fully support it. I mean, I, I would argue that means that there's, there needs to be more forums for dialogue and sharing and more forums for useful sharing of process, per, for example. This is a lot of this work that we saw today is about different ways of working, isn't it? It's not necessarily the exact outcome as a silver bullet that's gonna solve a problem, but more about how do we work together? This is kind of really the endeavor I think we're, we're all sharing, Lynn. Um, and to answer uh, Alex's question, or at least to address it, um, we do need to find better ways to create bridges for uh, especially youth in remote communities or in, in more isolated communities. I mean, geographically speaking, of course, um, but so first and foremost, it's important for the school of architectures, um, for example, like ours, to reach out to programs, to different high schools, to try to get them, get uh, educate uh, youth in those areas at those levels, sorry, to, to uh, understand what pathways there would be to become um, a licensed architect or to be trained as a designer in some fashion. So that's the first work. The work falls on us as academics to reach out to communities to share that wisdom about or at least pathways. But for students that can um, get the idea about what to do, Honestly, it's about actually identifying programs they might be interested in. Look for schools that are actively engaged in dealing with First Nations issues and indigenous issues and that they prioritize that. I think that would be first and foremost. And, um, and, to, and to read up on both colonized and also non-colonized and indigenous forms and histories of building and making because we need all histories to move forward. We don't, we can't rely only in one. We have to kind of approach arguably um, design and architecture as a hybrid endeavor uh, it, because we need to take advantage of, of all the forms of knowledge in my opinion. Um, and uh, so I think it can work from both ways, but I think it definitely falls on us as academics to reach out to communities, especially youth to show them possible pathways. It's so important. And even as part of um, our Boreal Home Builders, our Minnesota Madison program, uh, bringing the students to the university, one ended up applying, getting in, and she, she, she's following an interior design path. So, you know, it does create a pathway that's so important. Um, did anybody else the, want to answer? Pardon? I, I wanted to add from student to student, if you may, <laughs> um, in a very not so abstract way, but like as a, a student trying to find a place that fits their specific needs or their specific cultures, one of the things that I've found very good uh, when selecting a school is really going into the faculty and reading into the or into the institution and looking at the faculty and see the representation amongst uh, staff. Um, I think or even like research topics amongst the faculty, I feel like that's really telling to values and interests and opportunities in your own, like in your own research. And that's kind of how I landed on 
uh, the University of Manitoba personally. And I also want to stress and really emphasize that any students that are coming from their own cultural backgrounds, regardless if it's First Nations or, or what have you, to really like wear that on your sleeve and, and make that a part of your like design fabric. Like it is, it's like such an important part of you that needs to be like shown in all these faculties. It's, there's not enough representation. And I think that really like spearheading and like owning yourself and really being confident in where you come from and your history is like a very wonderful thing to contribute to these institutions. They would be lucky to have you rather than the other way. So I just wanted to say that. And Noah has a question. Thank you so much, Katrina, Kat. And Noah, did you wanna ask your question? Sure, please. Um, I'd just like to say first and foremost, thank you for uh, thank you for all the work you've been doing. This is uh, this is really awesome stuff to see. Um, I come from a background of uh, well, I'm currently working for a southern uh, sorry non for profit and indigenous non for profit in the sports sector, Manitoba's Aboriginal Sport and Rec Council. So I have the opportunity to travel to a lot of communities and uh, mentor young individuals in getting and starting a career in sport. But I'm finding a lot of the issues is the actual infrastructure isn't there to be able to sustain any long-term sporting developments. So I'm starting to look into different alternatives and how we can get more mentorship opportunities involved in actual building uh, these actual projects because the program that we're running now is trying to build the human resource capacity through the vehicle of sport, but we're not technically allowed to go into the realm of building um, physical, uh, physical capacity, which I'm finding is an issue. So I'm just wondering, what are some of the avenues that people like me and other Southern and Indigenous organizations can recommend our mentees to follow? whether it be through a Red River mobile uh, building station, or how does one actually become a facilitator involved in these kinds of initiatives? Thank you. Well, um, where do we start? Maybe Sean, you might be able to answer this. I, I know we've really tried to work with Red River. Um, it's very expensive to get their mobile, but in maybe the interlake that would work. Uh, they wouldn't, they didn't want to take it up over winter roads because it would stay there um, for it too long and it's very expensive. You need a security guard on it all the time. So there are some limitations of that, but I think there's, I think we're going to create a pathway and maybe Sean, your way of bringing in all the materials uh, and, um, through a crate and Alex is, is um, Alex Wilson, Dr. Alex Wilson's approach has been to, um, you know, fund tiny homes. So she's actually created, you know, a way if we, the funding has been missing. That's been a, for the materials and that's been the huge aspect. And I think, you know, I, I, I see Alex's approach where you have the materials, you start small, you see the accomplishment, accomplishments, as really a, a great way to start and see what's possible. And, uh, you know, as with the instructors, um, there are a variety of instructors that are possible. Uh, and there are, um, uh, you know, First Nations colleges and vocational training programs as well, right? As well, so it does take it beating the bushes though a bit. And Sean, did you wanna mention something? Um, no, well, being quite new to this myself, um, I think, you know, the shipping container, it, it worked, but it, it wasn't, um, we found that it would provide some limitations because we're not designing sort of onto the site. It was too separated. So I don't know, there's some, some work to be done on that. Yeah, and we having the sawmill really worked like all the local lumber was applied in Garden Hill. Um, and with Sagamac, we had some of the lumber, like there are more policy problems with that, like colonial problems, really, um, that 
create barriers. And um, so, you know, we're trying to, each, each of these steps move us forward, right? And we're gonna run into barriers, but realizing we just have to, you know, resolve that or, and find a pathway through and keep trying. Like housing, housing is too important. <laughs> you know, uh, homes are too important for to stop, right? And, and same with, you know, the opportunity for starts, sports and the opportunities for youth. You know, we've got to find ways. This can't continue as it is. It's unacceptable that of overcrowding. It's unacceptable. Um, the health risks from COVID, from many other things, the result of, of bad housing. So uh, let's all work on this, please. And um, Can I say one Hanos, about that? go sure. ahead. All right. I just want to say um, it's a really good question, Noah. And, and I think what you're referring, what, what you're question points to is the fact that um, so much of our um, energy, collectively speaking, is focused towards just basic fundamentals, which is having a home that's healthy. That's it. That's just like all of this conversation and so much of the federal government's money that is going towards this challenge um, is, is trying to solve a basic human right. It's not even dealing with the fuller life that we should be talking about, right? Which it does include other activities, which in talks about ways that communities can thrive and grow and become prosperous, not just survive. And I feel like that your question points to the infrastructure necessary that can start to facilitate that. Um, so I, I, just, I just want to acknowledge that you're raising a point, which is that we need to evolve past the problems of just survival. Um, and if we can do that, parallel to talking about homes. And that's kind of what I think I was at least trying to lead to is that the question about designing of homes has to in fact incorporate a fuller sense of what living is about to make them meaningful and not just be about staying alive, frankly. We have a question from Panos who's going to unmute. Hello everybody, I, uh, excellent presentation. I, I commend your work and I love the imagery. Um, I had a question uh, um, I had written here. Um, it's written, uh, was indoor air quality an issue which was considered with regards to the home designs? And uh, I had also commented uh, wood stoves uh, can potentially lead to unsafe particulate matter, PM 2.5 concentrations, and uh, were cleaning, clean burning or pellet wood stoves uh, considered in the designs? Yeah. I was, I, uh, Panos and I, or I tried to answer Panos's question in the chat <laughs> because I wasn't sure we'd have enough time, but um, for sure. And I think Panos, you picked up on the door swing issue as well earlier in your chat. So um, we did a, a thorough design review, uh, the, all the plans that, the, the, uh, in, the, that actually were constructed off of were, were engineer stamped. So the door swing issue was picked up then. And so um, I, what, what Kat and I showed you was kind of an early design iteration. So it's not the final design drawings. Um, and also the, the pellet stove absolutely came up and that is, um, we're, we're hoping to leverage the idea of the industrial waste coming up a sawmill to develop pellet technology to feed in, you know, so have a circular economy where the pellets from the sawmill could be used in the, in the, uh, the clean burning wood stove. So uh, those are really good points, Panos, and that's, that's exactly like it's, it's a, there's a million pieces to this and even in building that simple square structure. <laughs> um, but for sure in the first iteration, the, the wood stove is not the primary source of energy for the home. It's meant to be as a backup. It, there is still uh, baseboard heating. I think we had looked at radiant heating systems in the building, but I think at the end it was just simpler because everybody was more familiar with how to install a baseboard, <laughs> um, that that's what went in. So buildability, keeping things simple, you know, uh, it's it's surprising, you know, how how, you know, as I mentioned with the whole HRV thing, you know, that we build in the South, we, we airtight something down to make it energy efficient. And then we have to put an HRV in, not realizing that when you do something like that in the North and the HRV breaks down, well, the nearest spare part is in Thompson or, you know, and the nearest guy that can fix it is in <laughs> Dooley Lake or oh, Churchill, you know, then, you know, it's not a simple thing. So, um, you know, maybe the pellet technology that who cares, there's, there's, there's a uh, water ground source, there's, uh, there's a number of different strategies you can make to, to sustainably heat and, and condition these homes. 
that's not overly reliant on these unreliable systems. So for sure, our concern was that the energy uh, from hydro goes out and it's minus 30 up there, you know, so you've got children, you have families, you know, you've really got to have a way to, to make heat. <laughs> and that was, that was something we really wanted to make possible because at the time, it surely, I know it's recorded, but it bothered me no end. Uh, the time that the hydro was put into the community, they forced the reserve to agree to take out all the wood stoves from the homes. Everybody had to remove their wood stoves from the homes in order for hydro to actually bring power to the community. Now that is systemic racism in play. <laughs> so, you know, wow. this is the kind of thing you, you know, you have to combat along the way. And I think we need that the, these acts of process um, as Lancelot and Sean are talking about, you know, this is part of the reconciliation. We are blind to a lot of what's going on. And even the simple thing, what's why, why can't we build homes in these places? How hard can it be? <laughs> it's, it's extraordinary the things you come out from simple things like the wood stove, uh, you know, all the way up. <laughs> Thanks. Anybody else want to answer that? If not, Katrina's going to unmute and ask a question. Hi there. Um, great presentations by everyone. It was uh, really inspiring. I um, work at an engineering consulting firm and I'm a former NGAP student. Um, I found this really fascinating. Um, I was curious what the relationship with this this whole organization and the work that you guys have done has been with the engineering, either the faculty or the community. Um, I just find this work really interesting. Um, and I, I kind of just haphazardly came across it. And I, I noticed on one of your calls that Randy Herman was on there. Um, so I reached out to him yesterday, but I didn't, haven't heard back yet um, to know more. But I was just curious what the relationship was. Um, I. Um, I graduated four years ago and I'm thinking how nice it would have been if we had a, um, at the end of our degree, we do a, like a, they call it a capstone. It's not called capstone anymore, but a, a final project and how interesting it would have been to, instead of being um, only civil engineering students, but to be a multidisciplinary team across the departments and uh, be able to carry out a project like this. Um, I know how challenging and it's not as simple to just add a course to the engineering curriculum. So I know it's not um, an easy answer, but I'm just curious if any uh, work has been done in that area. So I'm cross-discipline between engineering and architecture and the Shoal Lake Design Build course was engineering students and architecture students. Um, and it was mainly civil students. So I think this time around, we have been starting to receive emails from um, all, all disciplines um, excited to take the course. So it, this project, you know, it was the first one and I think um, they're gonna be offered in the future and they'll keep being, um, hopefully they'll keep growing. Um, and then with, with Randy Herman and NGAP as well, we have a newly formed indigenous student design um, association. And so what we're trying to do is join EDIPSA, that's the Architecture Association, Student Association, and ANGAP together um, to start creating and establishing some projects in the future. That's really exciting for the students. I'm really happy to hear that. Thanks, Sean. Yeah, you're welcome. And I think we'll, there's one final question, and then we'll bring this to close. Um, Chima asked a question a while ago. And I'm not sure you can unmute, so I'll ask it. What possible architectural modifications are best suited for housing designs in Island Lake, considering climate change issue? Um, so do you, do you see how we're designing for the future and, and for the changes? I, I, I think that um, uh, in, in short, the idea of sovereignty design, sovereignty, energy independence, food independence. Um, I wish all of you could have seen Shirley's uh, Bart in the Box <laughs> that inspired me to become part of her design team, but um, it's all tied up in together because part of, uh, you know, folks have been living on the land north uh, uh, um, for many years quite, quite well. <laughs> so um, I think we have to think about Northern building codes being different than Southern building codes. 
and uh, approaches um, to be a, a different than we'd use here. Um, so as Kat mentioned, there's a certain resourcefulness that has to happen, um, you know, but uh, I, I think we have to look at approaches that are not what we, you know, you can't do high performance building in the North. You can't have complicated systems that have to be maintained and operated. So, um, you know, it, it's a longer answer <laughs> than we have for in the last minutes of this webinar. But I think, I think the, again, reiterating everything everybody else has said, it's a process. We have to work with communities, see what resources are there. Um, I can't, as an outsider, go and say, you need this. Um, because actually just, just going up there, you begin to see what's available and what's processed. I mean, there's water, there are trees. Um, we have extreme climate. Um, but we have lots of opportunities and there's lots of really wonderful people um, that are just ready and willing to participate in these projects and um, uh, there's no lack of enthusiasm so that's that's the wonderful thing and uh, it's just to, just to walk alongside with the communities and help them achieve what they're trying to do. Um, maybe I could also hopefully give some input on that. Um, it's a very good question um, and it leads into the fact that um, there's going to be a collaboration that uh, we actually collectively, all of us on this presentation panel are gonna be collaborating on a, a design studio project next uh, fall and winter terms. Um, Sean Bailey and I will lead studios on that uh, with the Minuba Banda uh, partnership. And uh, one of the questions that we will be uh, incorporating into the dialogue with the community is about how the community envisions a way to prepare for climate change um, as an open conversation subject. So climate change is a sort of another example about how it's a, um, it can be approached from a technical or, or, um, or, or sort of scientific or Western scientific way, um, or it actually can be dealt with in a local community-based way. Um, and that involves everything from the technical challenges and, and, and base ones that like uh, was being suggested about the idea of water levels changing and you know, but that, but that's not the extent of it alone, right? So it talks about longer dry days. So actually that there's going to be perhaps a drying out of the vegetation. It's going to impact migration of, of animals. That's going to affect food sovereignty issues. It's going to affect air quality because there'll be more forest fires. There's going to affect so many things that will affect the way the community interprets what the impact of climate change will be. And that's why conversation and dialogue is so critical because it is not that there is an answer to any of this, it is only a response. And that response is only meaningful if it comes from the community because the community is the one that lives with whatever is made as a solution or response to that. Uh, so climate change, I think is a very good starting point to, to, as an example about how dialogue will elicit a meaningful response to that question. And it's a really good question. And all of our global communities need to be confronting that basic question, of course, especially our, our remote and indigenous communities. Sean or anyone else, that was a great question. Thanks, Chima. And uh, I wanna thank everyone. I thank the panelists, Sean, Bailey, Shauna Mallory Hill, Lancelot Cora, Katrina, and Linda Lancome for joining and all of you for asking questions. And um, let's work together. Like this housing for all is such an important uh, goal, a, an important aspect of human rights and the idea that they have to be culturally appropriate and environmentally sustainable. So it's, it's great that we're all on board working together and let's see where we can take this to move it forward. Thank you all for your work and have a beautiful weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you, Shirley. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming. <laughs>